Right. So in order to understand the structure of an interface, uh, we are going to create an interface. All right? So supposing we start with a single crystal, and I cut the crystal in half. Yeah? You can see there's a slice in the middle. And to create a boundary, I tilt one half of the crystal with respect to the other by an axis going through the board. Then I'm left with a gap here. This blue region has nothing in it, right? But when you look at a grain boundary in a transmission electron microscope, it's not empty. It's filled with something. So how do we uh, cope with that? Well, this is a dislocation, right? And you have an extra half plane. And that extra half plane means that the planes near it are tilted like this, exactly as in the previous slide. So if you put an array of dislocations, then that fills up that empty space we had in the first slide. Okay? So dislocations correct for that space, and therefore, in the tilt boundary, we should be able to see dislocations when we look down a transmission electron microscope. Okay. So this is what uh, it would really look like. Uh, you've got a tilt by an angle theta, and instead of an empty space, we have these extra half planes filling in that empty space in the form of an array of dislocations, and the dislocations are spaced by a distance d, and simple geometry gives you the relationship between the spacing of the dislocations, the Burgers vector of the dislocation, and the angle theta. So this is a special boundary. It's called a tilt boundary because we cut the crystal, and then we bent the two halves with respect to each other. Okay. So the greater the misorientation angle, the finer will be the spacing of the dislocations. And this is an image of boundary around a bit of austenite in ferrite. And you can see arrays of dislocations. So physically, this is the real model for the structure of an interface. The spacing will change according to the plane of the interface and so on. But you will clearly be able to image these dislocations when you look at them in a transmission electron microscope. Yeah. So the structure of a boundary can be thought of in terms of dislocations with specific Burgers vectors and so on. And here I mentioned a tilt boundary where I cut the crystal and then I bend uh, tilt. But you could also have a twist boundary where I cut in this plane and then I twist like this. So there you would have some screw dislocations to accommodate the difference. OK. Uh, if you have an array of dislocations, then the dislocations will have a certain energy per unit length, right? And we know how the spacing between the dislocations varies with the angle theta. So if I add up the energy per unit length of all the dislocations in a unit area of the boundary, then I get the boundary energy. Right? So the boundary energy is uh, in joules per meter squared boundary energy in joules per meter squared. And we have a dislocation line energy um, energy per unit length of dislocation And do you know what that would be? If the, if the dislocation has a Burgers vector B, then what is the energy per unit length? Any ideas? So it's approximately equal to mu B squared, where mu is the shear modulus. And B is the Burgers vector. 
So if I simply take the energy per unit length and multiply it by the amount of dislocation line in a unit area of interface, then I've got my interfacial energy. So the boundary energy of unit area, is, we will label sigma. Therefore, sigma is equal to the energy per unit length of a dislocation multiplied by the number of dislocations I have per unit area of interface. So multiplied by length of dislocation line per unit area of interface. And we have a relationship between the spacing of dislocations. So um, the tangent of theta is equal to the Burgers vector divided by the spacing of dislocations. So as theta increases, I should see more and more uh, closely spaced locations and the boundary energy should increase, right? So if you focus on the blue curve here, you can see that the boundary energy is not increasing continuously. Yeah? So it's increasing sharply at first and then slowing down the rate at which the energy per unit area increases. Why do you think that is? Why, after a certain angle here, let's say 15 degrees, uh, does the rate of increase in boundary energy become slower? According to this analysis here, you know, as theta increases, the spacing between dislocations should decrease, and therefore we have a lot more line per unit area, and therefore sigma should increase. But that isn't what's happening over there. Why is that? So strictly speaking, this energy is when a dislocation is isolated because its strain field extends over a large distance. Okay? So this is, the, this is relevant for isolated dislocation where strain field extends over a large distance. Yeah, because you can work out the energy of a dislocation as a function, uh, the elastic field of a dislocation as a function of distance away from the core, and that can extend to infinity. So the energy per unit length can be infinite if you have an infinite crystal. What we are dealing with here is an array of dislocations in which the extra half planes lie on top of each other. Okay? So in the array of dislocations, the strain fields only extend a distance roughly equal to the spacing. Because here we have a region of tension, here we have a region of compression, here we have a region of compression and tension balancing each other out. So the strain field in array of spacing D extends approximately a distance D. So that reduces the energy of the boundary because you've got the extra half plane at the top cancelling out the space at the bottom. 
closer and closer they get, the smaller is the strain field of those dislocations. And you can see that actually in the transmission electron micrograph that the contrast from the dislocations is not extending a large distance. When you look at an isolated dislocation, you see quite a lot of gray uh, color from the contrast extending over a long distance. Okay? But here, they are located on top of each other, and therefore, they are canceling out each other's strain field to roughly a distance equal to the spacing. And therefore, the energy of the boundary doesn't increase sharply. So the blue curve doesn't continue to rise, but it tapers out. Now, eventually, the spacing will get very small so that you can no longer use elasticity theory. You know, the cores of the dislocations start to overlap, and that gives you a completely incoherent boundary. When we can distinguish the dislocations, that's a semi-coherent boundary. That means you have dislocations with coherent patches in between. But when the cores overlap, you don't actually see a dislocation structure, and that's an incoherent boundary. Okay? So the dislocation model of the interface is correct, and it tells us uh, how to calculate the boundary energy as a function of the misorientation. Now, there is a complication that at certain misorientations, you get a sharp decrease in energy. Do you know why that happens? Any ideas why suddenly the um, interfacial energy is decreasing at that point? So you find certain special values of theta for which the interfacial energy is suddenly decreases. And if I'm measuring the diffusion coefficient, the diffusion coefficient will also drop dramatically. Okay? So you know that normally we say that the diffusivity along a boundary is greater than in the volume of the material because there's free volume inside the boundary. At those special orientations, the diffusion coefficient also decreases. Ignore that. Okay, so um, what happens is that at that special orientation in the two crystals, the lattice points, uh, a certain fraction of lattice points match exactly between the two crystals. So imagine that uh, I have a crystal uh, and another crystal with the same origin, right? And we allow the lattices to interpenetrate and fill all space. Then you find that at certain lattice points, the lattice points from both crystals occupy the same space. So you have exact coincidence, okay? Not all the lattice points, but a certain fractions of the lattice points will match exactly. So obviously, that, those are regions of perfect fit. And therefore, you regain a certain amount of coherency. And I'm going to illustrate that with uh, a hexagonal crystal. You can see that uh, basically we have, we have an hexagonal array of lattice points, right? So I'm going to cut the crystal in the plane of the board and rotate one side with respect to the other, okay? One crystal with respect to the other so that they are at the same common origin in the middle. Right now, if you look at this, you can see that there's an array of points here 
which belong to both crystals and are in the exactly the same position. Okay? So if I count the number of these coincidence points and divide by the total, that gives me the fraction of coincidence points. Right? So the second thing to note is that these points themselves form a pattern which we call a coincidence site lattice. Right? So if we allow the lattices of two grains to interpenetrate, and fill all space, then we find that a certain number of lattice points occupy the same position, even though they are from different crystals. a fraction, 1 upon capital sigma, occupy identical positions and these are called the coincidence side points. where the two crystals are coherent. Oh, coherent. And these points themselves form a pattern which we call a coincidence site lattice. You can see that there's a regular pattern of coincidence points. So they form a coincidence site lattice. So we call this a CSL, right? Coincidence site lattice. And as I as I increase the angle, you'll see other coincidence site lattices forming. Okay. So if I have a coincidence site lattice with sigma equals to 3, then what is the fraction of lattice points that are common to both crystals? Remember that the fraction is 1 upon sigma. So if I have sigma 3, then one-third of all points are common to both crystals, right? Therefore, fraction of lattice points coincident equals one-third. And similarly, if sigma is 11, then the fraction is 1 upon 11. So a sigma 3 boundary will have a lower energy than a sigma 11 boundary, yeah, because more points are in coincidence. Okay? Therefore, sigma 3 lower energy than sigma 11. So when you're doing your EBST experiment, you know, your machine tells you these are sigma 3 boundaries or sigma 5 boundaries automatically, doesn't it? Yeah. That is the meaning of the value sigma, capital sigma. Okay? It's a coincidence site lattice. Is everyone happy with that? 